The first time you spoke at Stargram was in the summer of 2012. That was when the banana showed up. The right? banana guy showed up. <laughs> I've looked that startup up. It doesn't exist anymore. Oh, well. Uh, big surprise. Um, it's February 2017. What are the biggest changes that you've seen in the last four and a half years? Uh, we've written a lot of checks, I guess, and uh, been to a lot of different places around the world. But you know, startup and entrepreneurs seem like they're still going strong. Do you um do you you continue to go really hard internationally and the latest batch is another good example. Yep. What what was the breakdown of international versus domestic companies? Uh, I think about half and half. We had 14 countries represented out of 44 companies. I think some they had a couple of folks from different countries. So. And, and why why do you do that? Why are you why are why you, do we do that? Because there's people everywhere. I don't know. I think. <laughs> um, well, frankly, actually, usually they're less expensive in other places. <laughs> um, but I think we try and find uh, talented entrepreneurs where other people maybe don't look. Uh, and some of them want to come here. We don't have to bring them all here, but some of them want to come here. Yeah. What 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 differences do you see? Are they you know, in terms of the they're way they build companies, or tend what? to be more brown. They're more brown, okay. <laughs> or yellow, or red, or whatever. But yes, they're, they're different colors. And does that make their companies better? Does that make it? Uh, I guess I don't know. Makes them makes them different. What was that? Brown yeah. Brown does. What has brown done for you lately? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we we try and build a diverse portfolio, and that could be. Colors, shapes, sizes, genders, religions, whatever. It's, it's all part of the story. It's, it's, it's really, you see very few, very few investors in the Valley actually investing in. I don't think that's companies. true anymore. I think when we started, we were probably the only one doing that, or one of a very few, I think. But now, I mean, definitely YC, uh, since Sam took over, I think has done a lot more internationally. Uh, kudos to him and Michael and other people. Um, you know, Techstars has been growing, I think, internationally also. So. There, there maybe still isn't, you know, the majority of people, most folks who are here as investors generally invest in, this zip, in the zip code and maybe, you know, they stretch to L.A. and New York, but not much, much else. But, but those, I mean, those are really early stage, right? Like, do you, see, do you see Series A, Series B people? You have Sequoia, you have Excel sometimes doing investments outside of the Valley, but yeah. do you see other people, do you see these Series A people funding more international companies or? Uh, not multi-geography. Usually they're, you know, if they're international, they're probably doing it in one geography where they have some specific, you know, connections, either, you know, ethnic diaspora or they have an affinity for a country or geography or language. Um, but we are trying to do that globally. What's, um, what's been the hardest part about what you've done over the last Seven uh, or by eight way, years. It's not just me. There's a lot of folks. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I, mean, I mean, 500 as a whole. What's yeah. been... What's been the hardest part about building what you guys have built? I think that just in general overcoming uh, a lot of sense in the value that great companies only get started here. Uh, and that you know, there's a lot of people who don't really pay too much attention outside. You know, maybe they'll look at China, uh, a few folks maybe in Israel or Europe or India, but not too many people looking at developing markets around the world. What areas, what, it, what has surprised you in this last batch? Where did, tell us about some of the places you had people from. Uh, you know, all over. I mean, definitely we have a lot of stuff happening now in Canada and Mexico. We have funds and teams that are operating in there, but I think we have people from almost every continent. So folks from Southeast Asia, India, uh, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, and Europe. Uh, so trying to cover the road. Tell us about, um, I know a couple of years ago it felt like 500 startups was a 20-person operation. Now it's <laughs> we have about 150, 100, 150, or 150 people, yeah, yeah. roughly. Um, and probably a lot of people don't even know that, or they've started to see some of the international people probably started to see 500 startups partners or local leads kind of spreading up. How yeah. does the model work? How do how do these you know how how have you expanded so quickly in so many places? What are the, what are these people doing? Um, so when we started, I guess we had we were making investments from the very beginning in a few different geographies. That was initially probably. You know, Mexico, Brazil, uh, India, maybe Canada, and a few places. But those are all happening out of the main fund. Over the last uh, five, six years now, we've started to create separate funds in different geographies. So we have funds in about 10 different countries or regions right now. And we'll probably add another five to 10 this year as well. Um, about 
I guess 40 people on the team are making investments in different places. Um, about two thirds of the team is still here in the Bay Area, either in Mountain View and San Francisco where we run our primary accelerator uh, programs. I guess we call them seed program now. Um, but about a third of the team is spread across 20 other countries uh, all over the world. Why do people think it's so easy to make money as an investor? <laughs> Uh, it's certainly not easy, and the average VC probably doesn't make money. Uh, I, I still think people kind of have a misconception about how successful VCs are. VCs probably fuck up about as much as entrepreneurs do, <laughs> which, which is to say most of the time. Uh, so, you know, but they don't act like it. They don't walk around like uh, we, sorry, I should say we walk around like we're, you know, golden gods and that we get it right all the time and probably we don't get it right more than 20% of the time, and we don't get it right big more than like 5% of the time. I feel like I, like, I don't know if it's because of the, you know, the Facebook effect, the Snapchat, I don't know what it is, but I feel like if you pulled... Everything is awesome! <laughs> if you, if you pulled... Everything is awesome! Yeah. Everything is cool when yeah. you're part of... Okay. Awesome. Um, I think, you know, half, most... I don't know what the stats are recently, but in general, long term, I think about half of all VCs don't return 1x. Yeah. Another quarter beat 1x, but don't really beat the market. And then top quartile is what people talk about as good performance. But then if you look at consistent top quartile, it's probably less than 10% of the industry that's getting a money generating fund on a consistent basis. So you didn't start as a VC coming out of college, you were a founder? No, it took me a long fucking time to get to VC. <laughs> yeah. You were an employee, you were a founder, I mean, you kind of ran I the was gamut. Programmer, entrepreneur, kind of shitty entrepreneur, uh, marketer at PayPal, uh, angel investor, conferences for O'Reilly and other folks. Uh, finally kind of got a VC gig with Founders Fund with Sean Parker and Peter Thiel and then we started 500, Christine and I, uh, about six, seven years ago now. I feel like if you polled college, uh, business college students or you know, people that, uh, you know, we're gonna be consultants or we're gonna, you know, in, in a past life, we're going to Bain or McKinsey, or Lisa, now you pull them and they say, I wanna be a VC. There are, there are 19 year olds who are VCs. In fact, very good VCs, <laughs> I guess it's Tiffany Zong and a bunch of other folks now who are you know, 19, 20, 21, which I, I'm like, I don't know how the fuck you get that gig at 20. If you can, good on you, that's, that's a great gig. Uh, it took me until I was in my 40s before I was able to really pull a fund together. Do you think it's, I mean, do you think it's the right place to start? Because it seems like... I mean, I think if you can get the gig, it's an interesting place if you want to be in the world of startups and investing. I think it's very difficult for most people who aren't high net worth. Uh, even if you're high net worth, I think it's difficult. But probably if you're not, if you haven't already done a company that's caught a $100 million exit or you haven't spent 10, 15 years in the industry, I think it's tough to break into VC. Or, you, or you'll be doing PowerPoints and a lot of other grunt work for maybe five to 10 years before you get to do interesting shit. If you, if you founded a company on stage today, please don't. But if, <laughs> actually, you could. That would actually wouldn't be so bad. Um, what would you make sure that that company had? Like, what, what would you say today? Like, th these are the things that I wouldn't, e I wouldn't dare start a company today without these things in place. I, mean, I still think you need talented engineers, probably a design UX person, uh, hopefully someone that knows how to do online marketing or customer acquisition. Uh, one of those two or three people probably need to know how to, you know, lead a team and raise capital. Um, most people don't start out with all those pieces. I think I used to say hacker, hipster, hustler was a sort of the holy trinity there. Uh, that still that probably still holds true? true. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, Are we really fucking boring? I feel like we're really boring right now. I gave you shit about this five years hoping, ago, right? I'm just hoping... I'm just hoping those six-year-olds I saw aren't having walked out of this place. <laughs> let's let's talk about somebody something ear, exciting and them. controversial. Trump or Uber or <laughs> something. All right. All right. Let's talk about Uber. So, so uh, Actually, let's talk about both. Let's talk about holding, holding tech leadership accountable. Okay. Because... Uh, because I, I think that we are, I think that we are demonstrating in the wrong direction. Okay, how so? I think we are 
demonstrating in DC and with our elected representatives, and if our elected representatives are the ones we voted for, you probably don't need to demonstrate too much to them, and if they aren't the ones you elected, they're probably not gonna fucking listen to you anyway. But uh, the people that you work for and the people you buy shit from should really fucking listen to you, and they will if you tell them. But I think that, you know, as much as I appreciate, you know, the Women's March and, you know, all that stuff, I think that's great, but we should be marching on the doorsteps of our companies and investors and telling them how we feel, because those are the people who are actually getting invited to Trump fucking Tower, and, you know, if you want them, well, but, you know, did they say what you wanted them to say when they were there? They were probably just talking about repatriating capital. The companies that were invited there were the ones that have a shit ton of capital overseas, and that's probably why they were there, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if you want them to be talking about immigration, and women's rights, and gay rights, then you need to tell them that, and you need to ask them to do that. And surprise, when you actually do that, they actually respond. I think Travis did respond when people actually you know, decided to start demonstrating by deleting or switching apps, and that might be what's motivating him today as well. I mean, on the other side, Michael Jordan famously didn't say, but is credited with saying that Republicans buy shoes too. So half the country is voted. Is, I don't is think we are form. worried about Republicans. I think we're worried about autocrats and despots and fascists and people who are kind of basically perverting the things that this country is all about, or at least the things that we hope this country is all about. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I worked at PayPal with a lot of folks who were right of center, who I thought, you know, I didn't always agree with, but I had, was able to have a conversation with. Still playing with. out from time to time on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, again, I think, you know, we need to look at where we can exercise power and voice, and right now, you know, that's Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page and, you know, perhaps a few other folks. Um, and I think maybe they've, had the opportunity to sit a little bit on the sidelines too much. Yeah. And I think we need to probably hold their feet to the fire a little bit more. I think that, you know, it's not, I, I think that Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page are as much responsible for this election as Comey and the Russians are. And uh, How is that? I don't think that they would, I think Facebook's responsible for distribution of bullshit news and Google's responsible for monetizing it. Don't you guys think that's true? Who do you think had more impact on the election? Putin, Comey, or Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah. And it wasn't because he didn't know there was something wrong. People raised that to his attention prior to the election. They chose not to roll out a news verification tool. Now he is making a bunch of moves towards that, which is great, except we already paid the price. So, I don't want to carry it too much further beyond that, but it is, you know, it's not censorship per se, it's just making sure that the shit that you read, you know the source and you know whether it's verifiable or not, and you know whether it's on some fucking server in Macedonia where teenagers are making money. And I think it's very clear that Facebook had a role in distribution and Google had a role in monetization, and they were asleep at the fucking wheel. Period, full stop. So if you're demonstrating in Washington and you're bitching about Trump, bitch about yourselves and talk to your leadership, talk to the people that you work for and you buy products from. Because Travis will fucking listen if you go take a ride on Lyft. And Mark Zuckerberg will listen if you take 50 programmers and you walk out the door and go work for Snap. I guarantee fucking to you he'll listen. Yeah. You are, you are way more powerful than you realize, but don't expect DC to listen to you. Anyway. Could you just be honest and tell us how you really feel <laughs> about this issue? You just, just well, I mean, this stop is, giving this is us right, service. No, this is right at home. I mean, like, you know, Peter Thiel is someone I've worked for twice. Uh, he's an investor in our first fund. You know, I think Peter's a really smart guy, and I think he was a great CEO at PayPal, but 
Frankly, I think he's on the wrong side of history right now. Um, you know, I, I think he's, he can be, you know, maybe hear alternative points of view, but I think we need to make sure that those points of view are heard. Um, I, I don't lay it all at Peter's feet. I think, you know, he's gotten a lot of press for maybe the wrong reason. There's other people who really have more influence on what's well, going the, on. And at the same time, like, we have an abysmal voting, you know, percentage in this country. I mean, people... If, I always say, like, you shouldn't complain about politics we, if we you have can't no be one, bothered to vote. We have no one to blame so, but ourselves so. and maybe, you know, a few Russians and the FBI. Wayne Zuckerberg, which you said earlier. Zuck. Blame I mean, Zuck. There, there were a lot of things that influenced the election, so you can't point at just one. But definitely yeah. lots and lots of people had a part to let's, play. Let's talk... Let's, let's, let's talk, move on. Let's move on. To something yeah, more controversial. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about Uber. So for those that missed the news uh, <laughs> today, yesterday, wow. there, there was an, a, an engineer at Uber, a woman who uh, was, uh, received some horrible sexual advances from her manager and other, other people. So a man that, that wasn't the part that, that she, was most horrible. Well, I'm getting the, the HR department I'm was to, what I'm just was said, I'm horrible. It up. So she went to her HR manager and her manager said, this is his first offense. We can't do anything about it. Forget about it. And if you... No, she, they said you, he's a high performer. And so, you know... Yeah, and if you want to leave, if you want to leave, you can leave the group. But if you want to stay in the group, he could also ding you down the road in your, yeah. in your, uh, your ratings. And there's nothing we can do about I, that. I don't want to speculate too much because I have no first-hand knowledge we don't know. of the situation. I mean, we, we, we assume but it's true, yeah. that post was particularly damning. Yeah. Uh, and again, more because, not because there was sexual harassment in the workplace, which I think happens in a lot of places, but HR, the HR department's response to that was fucking ridiculous, what, if, if it happened that way. What, what has to happen from a culture standpoint for these kinds of things not to happen? What do you as a founder, as an entrepreneur, have to set up in place at the early stages so that these, when your company does scale, that these kinds of things don't happen? I mean, I don't think this is an easy set of issues for the individuals. I think that there's a lot of, you know, you know, Men and women working together are going to have issues that come up, and men probably need to be a lot more educated about how they act in the workplace. Um, but probably the HR department and how company management interacts has to be more you know, involved and aware. And certainly sounded like there was you know, inappropriate ways that they responded with that. Um, I, I don't know. Again, you know, I don't have in, any particular firsthand information about what's going on over there. Yeah. Um, you hire, you've hired a very diverse team, you, you, I mean, and you have for a long time. Everywhere, everyone's, we're all talking about it now. Crunchies has an award now to award people with it. Like, but you've, I think had, we're you've done this for starting, a very long time. Yeah, I don't want to wave the flag like I've solved the problem or anything. I think we all need to work harder to be inclusive and figure out, you know, it, it's difficult if you don't put diversity early on the agenda and, you know, if you're a multi-hundred person organization and you don't have a large black or Hispanic population in your workforce, it's going to be hard to change that quickly. Um, you know, we got to 100 people and actually didn't have that many black people on the team. We had a lot of Asian people on the team. We had uh, people in Mexico, but we didn't have a lot of Hispanics in the U.S. And that was kind of our mistake for not paying more attention to that. Um, I think we were pretty diverse globally, but we weren't that diverse in the U.S., or at least not as much as we could have been. When it's two or three people, I mean, you're literally begging people to work for you, right? You're anyone with two <laughs> legs and a brain, like they can well, they probably have a, a big role. They could have not, a big role. It's not in your so company, much whether right? you're small, but what your ability to pay is. I think that that has a huge impact. Uh -huh. um, when Christine and I started, we weren't, and we're still not necessarily paying as much as maybe other VCs. But I think you got to build a story that's interesting to people, and you have to, you know hire people of color or start your companies with people of color and not just the typical, you know, white guys from Stanford or Harvard or whatever. Um, I think, I don't know, I, people talk about the stats getting worse. I do feel like I think it's getting better. At least the conversation is more open about that. Um, people seem to be caring more about it. I don't know if the numbers are changing. Uh, yeah. Tracy um, Chu, I think, started doing diversity uh, numbers publishing that when she was at Pinterest and encouraged other companies to publish those numbers, which was great, but I don't think we've really seen a lot of change in those numbers 
you know, two, three years after the initial publicist. Do you have any out. data on the valuations of female-led companies versus male-led companies? Are they the same? Are they different, better, worse? I, I don't know that we have rigorous information about that. I've certainly heard other people say that, you know, more diverse teams perform better. Um, I would frankly say that, you know, we feel like a lot of people overlook women and other founders, you know, whether they're international or domestic, uh, who aren't white and Frankly, we probably do get a lower valuation for those companies. Um, I'm often heard saying that we'd like to uh, arbitrage racism and sexism for our own benefit. Um, I think you have to take a, a monetary and numbers point of view on that. I don't, I don't think we should be doing it just because we want to make the world a better place. That's part of it. Um, but we have to prove to people that we are you know, building companies that perform better by making them more good business. business. Yep. Um, can I ask you a boring question again, or is sure. there any other controversial things that you'd like to? Probably, we've probably done okay so far. I think, yeah, yeah I think yeah. we got we got what we need. Um, <laughs> should be. Um, what's, I didn't throw anything at anybody yet. So, what, uh, what's a realistic valuation for a seed, seed stage company right now? In Silicon Valley. Well, or not. Uh, I would say probably between five to ten, but depends on progress. What what kind of progress is that? Um, I would say functional product, early customer usage, let's say, you know, if, they're, if we're talking about revenue traction, then maybe, I don't know, a million dollars a year in revenue. I think if you, if you had a million dollars a year in revenue and you were not burning a shit ton of cash, you know, you might be towards the higher end of that five to ten range. If you're maybe only at a quarter million to half million in revenue, you might be towards the lower end. But there's different business models, too. And, and what about Series A? Series A is so all over the fucking place, I don't really know what that means anymore. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you have a three to five million dollar Series A round, sometimes you have a 20 million dollar Series A round, so it's very difficult to... I, I think uh, we were talking about this backstage, Charles Hudson said, what it probably means is you're giving up 20 to 30 percent dilution. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably more the metric. And your seed? Uh, that depends, but I think you might be able to get away with only 10 to 20 percent at seed. Depends on whether you're doing that as convertible note or price round. Do you see any sort of trend towards founders protecting more equity earlier or keeping more equ equity long term? You see, like yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's happened gradually over the last 10, 20 years. I mean, you used to raise entire funding rounds just to build product and just to get to market. Now I think people are being a lot more frugal about doing that kind of bootstrapped or on their own you know, friends and family money. Um, so I think now when people are raising capital, they're really uh, hopefully trying to you know, do customer acquisition and really grow the business, uh, not just paying that money out to you know, hardware, software, or other types of capital intensive strategies. Are we still in early innings of the tech craze or do you feel like, like we, got, we got, literally we have kids in the audience. I, I know I said that earlier, <laughs> I was serious. Like, if, if, I'm, if I'm 10 or I'm 15 and I'm talking about being an entrepreneur and I'm trying to get into tech, like, what do you, I don't th think what do you that's think that a looks like? bad thing. I mean, I think sometimes I worry that we glorify entrepreneurship a little too much and it's not really that glamorous. It tends to be a pain in the ass and most people fail and it doesn't really pay that well uh, unless you, you know, are in the top 5%. Um, so I think right now everybody sort of feels like you know, they're going to be the next Facebook or you know, Twitter or Snapchat, but um, I, th I think probably what's more relevant is, you know, can you figure out a way to employ 100 people and generate 10 million in revenue profitably? And I think that, to me, is the beginning of a really, you know, interesting business. I don't know that that's what we're aiming for, but certainly, you know, employing 100 people and making 10 million profitable is, is probably uh, an admirable feat that most people don't, don't do. Yeah, yeah, but to get there, you've got to, yeah, you've got to. And that might take five years, you know. Or more. Or more, yeah. right. Yeah. What are you seeing with that with companies? Are you, are you seeing it, is it, is that normal? Is it taking longer? Is that, I mean, we, we have shares vesting over four years for people, is it? I think that there are more efficient swings at the bat. I think people probably don't always find product market fit. They don't always build, you know, that 10 person team and raise a million bucks, but for the folks who do, they probably progress faster after that, and the folks who fail maybe retry that part faster. Um, so I do think we're kind of getting more efficient, at least in certain parts of the world. There's other places where you know, people are still going through that first 
decade or so of entrepreneurship and still building that track record and base. Do you, what, what does success mean for you? Like, you personally, you, you, like we see you all around the world, we see 500 startups, we see the companies you invest in, but like for you, at what point do you say like, this is where I thought this could get to and I'm content um, here or are you there or? No, <laughs> well I don't even think we're really successful yet. I mean, I, we started about seven years ago and you know, we're working on our fourth fund and our first fund looks pretty good, our second one looks pretty good, we'll see where the third one goes. I think if we, if we you know, were successfully able to return capital from our first three funds uh, to our investors, that would be one measure of success that I would be proud of. Um, I think what we're trying to build is, you know, reproducible startup success in places all around the world and do that with some level of, of efficiency. And again, efficiency meaning 20 to 30 percent. We're not even talking beyond 50 percent right now. Um, we've been investing in about 500 companies a year for the last two years. Um, I guess right now, you know, near-term success would be interesting if we could be doing 5,000 companies a year and maybe be 5x the size that we're at right now. So if we were, you know, a 500-person company and 100 of those people were making investments, you know, realistically probably, you know, 20 investments per year per person is probably the pace that I think we could do. So if we could move from 500 to maybe 2,000 to 2,500 companies per year, I would say that would be an interesting level. Wow. But I mean, I don't think that's really where we're headed is, I, I think it's, it's, it's funny when you think about VC firms, you know, we're already a 150 person VC firm. There's not that many VC firms that are over 100 people. Um, and people think that, wow, that's a really big firm. And I'm like, you know, startups that are 1,000 people aren't that big. But VC firms with 100 people seem to be huge. I, I think we're really, we're not doing so great at scaling ourselves and you know, being able to create a large company that does investment doesn't seem to be that crazy. You know, if I said, hey, I want to start a five to 10,000 person company that does real estate or does you know, financial investment, I don't think, most people might think, oh, well, that's ambitious, but that's not crazy. If I told you I want to start a 5,000 person VC firm, they were like, wow, that's, that's really fucking nuts. Um, but I don't think it is. I think that's quite doable. Um, you know, more and more, I. I'm not really doing investing in startups day to day. Most of the time I'm trying to raise money or help our fund managers you know, get off the ground. I think more and more the company name probably is gonna be 500 startups, gonna be more like 500 VCs. So if we, could, if we could get to that stage, I think that would be interesting. How can people get involved? When's the next batch open? When, when? Uh, pretty much all the time we're accepting applications now every quarter. Uh, if you look at the 500.co website, you'll find information there. Uh, find another 500 startup founder. Um, don't hit me up, please. I, I'm probably incompetent at this point. Um, but there's about 50 other people in the company that you should uh, talk to. One of the things I love about 500 startups is those people are accessible. I mean, you, you actually can get a hold of them. You can meet with them. And there's a lot of firms that's not possible. So it's really not that hard to get a hold of somebody at 500 startups. That's not you. I hope so. Hope yeah. so. Yeah. Dave McClure, thank you for being here. Thank you.